Hello everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to the second session on the webinar on mapping and monitoring lakes and reservoirs with satellite observations. Again, I'm Amita Mehta and this webinar is conducted with my colleague Sean McCartney. Last week in the first session, uh, we saw uh, information, basic information about lakes and reservoirs. Then we had an overview of remote sensing observations relevant for monitoring water extent and water level height and bathymetry. And then we focused on water extent data sets or based on water extent surface uh, area of lakes and reservoirs. We saw a number of data sets, um, including MODIS based water mass. Uh, we also saw hydro lakes, which is lake polygons derived from a sh shuttle radar topography mission. And finally, we saw a high resolution uh, water extent or lake extent data from uh, Landsat that was derived by Joint Research Center. And we also had a demonstration by Sean McCartney how to access Landsat based water extent data that is global surface water. Today, our focus is going to be on water level height data uh, for lakes and reservoirs based on radar altimetry. And then next week, we will conclude this webinar series with laser altimetry measuring lake level height and bathymetry. I want to acknowledge help of Dr. Sharon Burkett from NASA Goddard. She's the expert on radar altimetry and in deriving lake level heights. She has contributed several slides and information to this webinar. So thank you, Dr. Burkett. Again, this is just a reminder about the website where you can find all the information about this webinar. And homework assignment will also be posted on the same website. Uh, last session, which is next week, we will be posting this homework assignment as Google Form, and it's due by March 23rd. And um, for those of you who attend all webinars and complete the homework, will receive a certificate, certificate of completion in about two months after the completion of the course. So with that, we'll start today's session. First, we will have a brief history of satellites with radar altimeters, which are used to monitoring lakes and reservoirs. Then we will see how lake level height data are derived from these radar altimeters. And we'll see examples of lake level height applications. Finally, we will have a demonstration of how to access lake level height data. So we'll start with satellites with radar altimeters. And before that, Let's see what is an altimeter. So altimetry is a technique for measuring height and a radar that is used for measuring height is called an altimeter and it operates on, on the principle as shown here schematically. A radar transmits a pulse to the target or earth surface in this case and then measures reflected echo back so the time taken by a radar pulse to travel from the satellite antenna to the surface and back, combined with precise satellite location, it provides information about height. And satellite radar altimeters are used to get sea surface heights, wind speed, and currents. And as we will see next, there is a long time series of altimeter uh, flying on satellites. As you can see, all the blue satellites are past missions. Um, the green one are the current missions and the future missions are in orange, except for the JSON uh, mission, which is already launched a few months ago. But you can see that starting from 70s, altimeters have been flying um, on, on NASA satellite as well as on European satellites. The first one, that uh, we will see data from is Topex Poseidon. It was launched in 1992. It's a collaboration between NASA and French space agency CNES. Then this is European uh, radar satellite um, GeoSat, um, and then NASA satellite JSON-1, and we said was again European uh, space agency satellite. These are all past satellites. They had altimeters flying on them. And then the current missions 
uh, that NASA has are um, JSON 2 and JSON 3, and current recently launched JSON continuing uh, series or Sentinel 6. And we will talk about some of these satellites, especially we'll focus on the current satellites, uh, JSON 2 and JSON 3. Also, Sentinel 3 is a, a European um, Space Agency and Copernicus satellite, uh, which is um, also which also has an altimeter. There is Cryosat, there is Haiyan, this is a Chinese satellite, and this Saral Altika, which is Indian Space Research Organization and uh, French CNES, Space Agency Collaboration Satellite. So these are currently flying satellites. Um, and a future mission is SWOT that we will see uh, briefly. But we will focus on the data available from mainly from JSON 2 and JSON 3, but also there's a long time series based on Topex, Poseidon, JSON 1, uh, and also there are data from Saral Altica. Um, so we will see um, how these data can be accessed. So let's move to JSON 2 and JSON 3, which are the current altimeters flying. So these two satellites, uh, so JSON 2, which was ocean surface topography mission, uh, and then JSON 3, uh, they continue, continue measurement of JSON 1, which was um, after Tupac's Poseidon, this was JSON 1 was NASA satellite that launched altimeter. Um, JSON 2 and 3, they are collaborative missions between NASA, NOAA, uh, CNES, and UMETSAT, or European um, Center uh, Meteorological Satellite Organization. Uh, these satellites, so JSON 2 was launched in, in June 2008 and JSON 3 in January 2016, both are currently flying. The orbits of JSON 2, every 10 days are shown here. The, the orbits are, are circular and they are non-sun synchronous. They provide coverage between 60 south and 60 north. And again, the revisit time as shown here is close to 10 days. So main instrument on both these satellites are altimeters so and, and the name Poseidon so Poseidon 3 is flying on JSON 2 and Poseidon 3b on JSON 3. Um, there's also advanced microwave radiometer so this is a radar um, then this radiometer it basically helps in uh, looking at intervening atmosphere for correction to um, the radar pulse echo delay, uh, so that's for atmospheric water vapor correction. Uh, DORIS, uh, which is for uh, having accurate orbital uh, position of satellite. Uh, similarly, laser um, retroreflector also helps in deciding um, precision location of satellite, and so does a global push positioning system uh, payload. So um, there is radar, there is radiometer, and these are to actually make sh make um, precision uh, information about satellite location in orbit. These uh, altimeters, they operate at two microwave frequencies. Um, KU band is 13.6 gigahertz and C band uh, 5.3 gigahertz. Uh, they measure range. So distance from the satellite to the Earth's surface from the radar echo. Um, data are processed, and that's a major part of altimetry. Uh, it's, it's a complex process, and there are tutorials available online uh, about altimetry. You can see here in this site. Uh, Poseidon 3 and 3B, uh, both uh, measure height. They both have... Um, so Poseidon 3b is improvement over Poseidon 3. And as it shows here, um, there are modes of measurements. And they basically either use stories um, or um, digital elevation model. And so those modes are selected differently in 3 and 3b, 3b being better at that. So modes are switched when open ocean, coastal, and inland water bodies are measured. 
So that's an improvement in 3B. Again, there are additional resources for details about Ultimate Tutorials. The links are provided here that you can um, visit if you are interested in learning more. Because getting data from Radar Echo, getting height of lakes and reservoirs, it's not a simple process, it's a complex process. Okay. And then this brings us to the JSON continuing, continuity of service mission. Um, and that is Sentinel-6. It's also called uh, Michael Freilich Satellite, named after a NASA scientist. Um, and it's an international partnership between NASA, NOAA, uh, European Space Agency, UMETSAT, and Copernicus. And these are some of the earlier data uh, of height shown here. Um, the, it, it, the, the, the system will include two identical satellites uh, designed to continue sea surface height measurements with radar altimeters. Uh, the first one, Sentinel-6, um, was launched in November uh, 2020, and the second one will be launched in 2025 timeframe. So there's also a future mission uh, upcoming, that Surface Water and Ocean Topography or SWOT mission. Um, this is planned for um, for 2020 timeframe, but that's a joint uh, development between uh, NASA, French Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, and uh, United Kingdom Space Agencies. And um, um, so, it so about a year from now, it might be launched. Uh, it's designed to make a survey of Earth's surface water to obtain detailed measurements on how water bodies on Earth change over time. And it will cover about 90% of global lakes, rivers, reservoirs, and oceans at least uh, twice every 21 days. And some um, orbits are shown here. It will have Poseidon um, altimeter on it, similar to what is there on JSON uh, 2 and 3 with the same frequencies, but it will also have a wide swath altimeter with Ka band frequency about 35 gigahertz um, and have uh, other instruments similar to JSON 2 and 3 uh, to, to get orbital position of satellite uh, precisely. So this will be launched and then it will provide river products such as height, width, and discharge. Um, that is a, um, if you go to, you will see um, a video which shows how, uh, and I'm just going to kind of move through this, but you can watch it later, that how river height, width, and discharge will be measured. Um, it is just shown in here. Um, that there can be multiple swaths covering different parts of a river, and then you can make a you can form something like this. So multiple times it will be observed. Similarly, um, there is lake product also with its height, area, and change in volume. So at when SWAT is launched again, this will be available. And this is mostly for your information. If we have time, we can uh, come back and watch this after uh, the session ends. But it basically shows how um, SWATs are going to go over lakes and reservoirs and provide information about lake height, area, and volume, everything at the same time. Uh, we have lake level height data uh, derived from radar altimeters that we saw, some historical and some current, and that is available from global reservoirs uh, and lakes monitoring or GRL. That's portally shown here from Foreign Agricultural Service of USDA, that is Department of Agriculture. Uh, this is the Cro Crop Explorer site that provides information uh, about lake level height at the lakes shown in here. So we are going to look at uh, this site and see how to get this data 
But before we do that, let's have an overview of how lake height is actually derived. So here, uh, it's important to know, like last week we saw for surface extent, we looked at modes or landset, we have horizontal images of lakes. That is not possible in radar altimeter because as you, as we saw, it is the pulse that is thrown and received back. So altimeter instrument do not record images, but they collect radar echoes along the ground track. An altimetric range is derived from these waveforms, as you can see here, narrow peak and broad peak um, echoes you can receive. And with knowledge of the satellite orbit location and certain atmospheric and tidal corrections, the range can be converted to a surface elevation. And usually that is given with respect to a reference ellipsoid on Earth. So that, uh, with respect to that ellipsoid, you can uh, measure, uh, convert that radar echo with the orbit information uh, to surface elevation. Um, now, spatial resolution and temporal resolution of altimeters depends on uh, the tracks shown here. So along track, uh, information of an altimeter data provides special resolution, which is a few hundreds of meters. Um, so, uh, and the temporal resolution is the across track uh, time that is taken that decides temporal resolution. So, here the white tracks shown are 35 day ground tracks. This is Lake Nasser in Egypt. So you can see there are several uh, tracks at 35 days. If you go a 10 day um, track, it is that there are not that many. It's, this is the, this is just one track. So uh, temporal resolution is decided by a cross track timing and then special resolution is the along track information. So, yeah, altimeter-based lake heights are derived from the difference between satellite orbit height and altimeter range. And there is a reference cited here, which is given at the end of the presentation, that describes how it is derived. So with respect to Earth's uh, ellipsoid, um, this range corrected for atmospheric contribution and Earth's tide contribution uh, lake height can be derived. Average height over a pixel is derived. So it is just one number per pixel. And then it is sensitive to satellite orbit accuracy, radar range accuracy, and lake surface conditions. So if it is a calm or smooth, or if it is a, if it is a rough surface due to winds or ice or precipitation, that affects accuracy of um, height that is um, derived from the range. Altimeters on JSON-2 and following mission show improved accuracy compared to previous missions such as JSON-1 uh, and Topex Poseidon. And again, the references are given here for more detail. And there are four different lakes are shown here. How, um, and, uh, so water bodies here you can see um, so this is uh, Lake Diffenbarker in 8th, um, Lake Powell Reservoir, Lake Windsor, and Great Salt Lake. So these four lakes and um, how their altimeter flies over them in narrow swath is shown here. And so the information you get is where you have, no matter how big the lake is, um, where the altimeter is looking down, that's where you get that. Uh, lake level height. This figure shows an example of how validation is done of altimeter derived lake heights. So usually it is done via comparison with in situ gauge data and uh, studies have shown that accuracies range from several centimeters to tens of centimeters. So the example shown is here, uh, here is Lake Ontario and this is Rochester gauge. So JSON-2 derived uh, altimeter data, so height data for 2000 and 
2009, they're shown here. And so the black dots show gauge level height in, in meter and the purple uh, signs, they show satellite derived height. And as you can see, um, you know, that there are some differences. There's a range uh, of satellite data all around this uh, gauge data. Uh, but as you can see, the variations are very nicely captured. And so, um, of course, the accuracy um, is within a few centimeters. Uh, but uh, basically, you can uh, see the variations. So going up or down that you can uh, see with time. <laughs> So how many lakes and reservoirs are observed by these satellites? So the current satellite radar altimeters uh, view only a few uh, lakes and reservoirs, just a certain portion of the largest water bodies. And that is shown here. So there's actually a trade-off between temporal and spatial resolution. So this is from um, Topax uh, and JSON series. You can see that there are 10-day resolution uh, available special resolution and the sampling of these water bodies about 800 out of which 330 are, are reservoirs so which are artificial lakes and the European Space Agency and um, ISRO uh, CNES series like CERAL uh, they show these are 27 day resolution and so the sampling here is 1580 water bodies uh, we saw earlier that um, there are more tracks when you have lower um, temporal resolution. And so you have more bodies covered here, more lakes covered. And after that, 400, 583 are actually reservoirs. So there is common sampling of about 650 lakes and reservoirs. There are also uh, continental water monitoring uh, web, web resources. Uh, we already talked about this. Um, Foreign Agriculture Service Crop Explorer that we're going to see in a minute, in a few minutes. Uh, and then these two sites also have information about continental water. So that's just for your information. So these, these are all based on radar altimetry. So there are some clear advantages of using altimetry. Uh, first of all, it, it contributes to um, information where there are no uh, gauge site available and we saw last week that worldwide there are millions of lakes and reservoirs of course they cannot all be uh, sensed through through altimeters but uh, in situ data um, e even if they are there um, if they're not available to everyone for any uh, study or application so this way um, radar altimetry can provide um, at least good coverage of uh, larger water bodies all over the world. There is day, night, and all weather capability because it's a microwave radar. Uh, generally, it's unhindered by vegetation or canopy cover. And surface heights are determined with respect to one common reference frame. So there's um, if you have two very different geographical locations, even then the reference is the same. Uh, so then the height can be compared, uh, which lake level height is bigger or smaller because the same reference. Um, repeat orbit, so within a kilometer or so, enable systematic monitoring of rivers, lakes, wetlands, inland seas, and floodplains, as we saw in Lake Ontario. Um, you can clearly see um, this monitoring over time, you can see that because of the repeat orbits. Surface water heights are potentially op obtainable for any target beneath the satellite overpass. So um, wherever it is going, you actually can derive that height. Uh, the ability to monitor seasonal or interannual variations during the lifetime of the mission is possible, and that's what it's it's used for, um, as we will see in the applications. Also, uh, the techniques to derive heights are validated, and so these are some of the advantages. Of course, there are limitations. Um, it's the satellite orbit scenario determines the spatial and temporal coverage, as we saw. Um, data can only be retrieved along a narrow nadir swath. Um, highly undulating or complex topography may cause data loss. 
because the range is affected by that. And um, um, height accuracy uh, about a few centimeters to tens of ten centimeters of root mean square error uh, can be seen in large open lake lakes. And um, it, it is dominated by size and surface roughness of the target. So we saw that earlier also. Major ev wind events, heavy precipitation, tidal effects, ice formation, they all affect data quality and accuracy. Um, mini, minimum target size is about 50 to 100 kilometers square, um, is also dependent on many factors. Um, and what you see is actually average um, height for the uh, footprint. Um, it, it's not a point measurement. So these are some of the uh, limitations. So, if, but in spite of that, we will see that these data are used for uh, several applications and a few examples are shown here. So um, this is again this GRealm uh, site from FAS and what this shows is uh, Mosul Dam, Iraq. This is uh, Lake Dahuk in arid region. It, it allows you to monitor um, how lake level height is changing. So time series is shown here for this particular lake. So uh, again, where there are no uh, gauge data, you can at least get some um, information, whether it is above average or below average lake height, you can see that. Um, it is used for agricultural decision. And so this is the crop explorer site. Uh, so multi both satellites and ground-based and model data sets, they're all included in here. And so this um, data set, altimeter-based heights are included in here. And this is for um, in assisting for agricultural-based decision um, because several reservoirs and lakes, uh, they may be used for uh, irrigation, for example. So then lake level height uh, information is very important. Applications for drought and agriculture that's shown here. These three lakes are in Middle East. Uh, this is Beisahir and Buhariyat and Urmia. So Turkey, Iran, Iraq. Uh, what it is showing um, is that there is a large scale drought going on. So all these lake levels are dropping in, in this 2001-2002 time frame. And so that indicates um, droughts. So then there is, there is recovery. So it allows one to see when there is um, deficit of water and then when there is recovery, either because of rainfall or from um, other sources. So um, that way, um, even if uh, you just have one measurement per lake, it allows you to kind of see how things are changing in time. This example shows how uh, lake level height can be useful for not only just water resources monitoring, but also in this case for energy resources monitoring. Um, so example is shown uh, for El Nino season in Venezuela. Um, there is a reservoir, a Gori Reservoir and Gori Dam um, is shown here. It's one of the largest hydropower facilities in the world uh, and um, uh, that provides energy for a large part of the country. But it El Nino related drought that you can see in, in this area, by the way, uh, the, the time series shows um, altimeter height variations from Topex all the way to Jason 2. So it starts from 1992 and goes all the way to 2014 in this case. And the important thing to note here is this period, El Nino period, when uh, there, there was drought because of lack of rain and then the lake level height dropped so much almost that reservoir reached that dead level. So that not only there was a problem with water resources, but also uh, energy generation uh, was uh, affected and there were power cuts uh, because of that. Not only that, 
as the uh, news um, shown here in, from the from the media that even after rain started coming back and water levels started coming up, still there were power cuts going on just to uh, kind of catch up with what had happened in the previous year. So um, it is uh, monitoring um, important reservoirs also that was important for energy um, resources management. Uh, this application also is for um, El Nino La Nina um, and this is in Zambia, Zambia and Zimbabwe, uh, where uh, Lake Kariba water level, as you can see, um, it, it, this is the dry period and uh, the power generation got affected. So this uh, monitoring lake level height uh, allowed to kind of monitor uh, how it affects power sector. Uh, just like drought, there is also applications for flood monitoring. This is in Lake Victoria. And these two periods are shown here. Again, these are like 97, 98 and 2020 floods, um, which Nile, Nile River floods, which are kind of indicated in Lake Victoria height um, above normal, as you can see here. Uh, also, um, a, a study uh, showed that um, uh, monitoring lake level height can also uh, help in monitoring fish catch potential. So that's also a um, very important application. So it is not just water, but also for um, fish catch, so for that, for flood, for drought, for energy uh, monitoring. Uh, lake level height data are useful. Now, um, here is uh, what the future looks like. Um, so, um, again, this is from Dr. Burkett. Uh, many hundreds of lakes and reservoirs will be added as uh, we go forward, as we have new missions, um, and uh, GRL will continue to supply all of that. So, blue show current JSON lakes. And a red one show potential NVSET lakes that will be included. And these are all croplands are just shown here. So additional lakes will help for agricultural applications. So this is what is in plan. And uh, this is the site that we mentioned last week. It is under construction right now. It is global water monitoring. Um, so it will provide information about um, lake extent and storage as well as water level products for wetlands and rivers. And next year, either later this year or next year, this site will definitely be um, operational and it will provide all the satellite based data products relevant to lakes, reservoirs, river channels, wetlands and global mean sea level. And so um, we, of course, when the website is up, um, we will be providing information about that also. And so the global water monitor for river reach and water level variations will be included. This is for um, example shown here is for Alaska stream flow in 2018. That how um, so Yukon River height variations are shown. So um, not just lakes, but river channels will also be monitored. Here is um, a, an example of wetland in, in, in Tanzania. This is um, Usangu wetland. And that also uh, water level uh, will be monitored and it will be available from Global uh, Water Monitor, which is really useful, not just for water and energy resources, and agriculture and also for conservation uh, and for ecosystem management and protection. So uh, this also is coming up in Global Water Monitor. And so the Global Water Monitor uh, will have lake levels, extent storage and state status indicator. So, um, so such as um, storage and status tab will tell you um, so stakeholders can go directly there and see if there is um, drought going on, if the recharge has already started. And so that quick indicator will also be available for um, 
decision making and so um, I think it the site is um, will be up uh, later this year but definitely by early next year this will all this will be available with that we're going to um, stop and look at uh, that GRELM site and see how to get um, how to access existing lake level height data. So here we are going to have a demonstration of how to access lake level height from altimeters. Uh, this is based on this GRELM site that we've talking we have been talking about uh, from USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. So there are two maps you will see here. Uh, and all the dots, they indicate location of lakes. Um, one thing to note here is that all the lakes we see here in on this site are uh, 100 kilometers square and above. That's the size. You can um, move your cursor to any of these dots and it shows um, which lake it is. Uh, also notice that there are two maps, top and bottom. The top one is with respect to single satellite overpass. So this is a um, near real-time product uh, with um, single satellite overpass. So when we look at the height, we'll see height um, in meters above mean sea level and variations in height with respect to single satellite. Whereas if you go here and pick on any of the dots, it shows uh, status data uh, with respect to multi-year means. So the reference here in this map is taken from top, Topex era uh, 1993 to 2000 time frame. F, uh, so um, the deviation in height or variation in height that are shown in this map are with respect to that mean. Before we actually look at the data, let's quickly look at the left-hand side panel to see what's available. Uh, there's some useful information here. Um, so here, they're all the missions that uh, we talked about. We focused on JSON 2 and 3 when we talked about instruments, but you can go through these missions and learn more about um, European uh, international missions um, available where altimeters are available. Altimetry data and tutorials are available from NASA PODAC and AVISO we talked about. NOAA also has information about altimetry data. There is information about ground-based data um, over the US, um, South Africa, there is global lakes and wetland data available. Also, uh, floods and droughts related websites are listed here, such as Dartmouth Flood Observatory, there is NASA Trim GPM Rain, Flood and Landslide Monitoring uh, site, NOAA Floods and US Trout Monitor. These data are complementary to lake level height variations. If you look at the top, um, here you will see link to global water monitor when um, it is up. Uh, you, it can be reached here, uh, reached from this site also. Um, these two, so top, this is the uh, it list all the lake, um, where they are located, which continent and country, which type of reservoir it is. More importantly, it shows what uh, temporal resolution is available for that particular lake. Uh, depending on which satellite overpass is available, so Topex JSON series 10 days, um, ERS NVSAT SARL series 35 days, and Sentinel series 27 days. So these are available, and then this is the time coverage overall for that particular lake. The second one shows all the lakes for which uh, this long-term uh, mean reference is used and uh, variation in lake level heights are available with respect to that reference. So again, same sort of um, information with uh, temporal resolution here. Um, then there are recent updates. Also, you will see that in, in this background, a lot of information is available about data processing, about 
altimetry itself. All the missions are given here, the timeline, and a more complete list of international satellites which carry uh, altimeters. They are uh, shown here. As you can see, um, um, the, the ISAT, which is already in orbit, we're going to talk about it next week, SWAT will be launched next year. And so here is a more complete list of satellites with altimeters. Then there are uh, advantages and limitations that we talked about already. Um, data sets themselves are described here. Uh, so especially the products, uh, and it explains um, that the uh, lakes are greater than or larger than 100 kilometers square um, are included in here. And then future, uh, we will have other lakes which are 50 to 100 kilometers. They will also be included. And then um, it talks about the two uh, different uh, products, the one with single satellite reference as well as one with multi-year mean reference. So with that, let's just look at how to get lake level height. So uh, to be consistent with what Sean demonstrated last week, let's look at Lake Winnebago. We looked at Lake uh, Extent uh, for Lake Winnebago. Here, let's look at the lake level height. If you click, you locate the lake and click on that, you will get the time series of height, lake level height variations. So this shows height variations millimeter above mean sea level. And this is with re respect to the single satellite reference in meters. So as you can see, the top panel is raw data, just uh, time series of height level variations. And this is the smoothed version of the same data. As you can see for Lake Winnebago, um, range uh, of variations is relatively uh, less compared to this uh, in, in JSON era compared to this Topex uh, uh, satellite. Uh, you also see where there is below um, average lake level height uh, was there in 2014. This shows um, satellite track and over Lake, lake Winnebago and information about lake can also be found. Uh, where it is, what kind of watershed management processes are going on, biodiversity, um, and also uh, different socioeconomic conditions are also uh, described in certain cases. So here's information about lake. Now, if you just click on it, you will be taken to the file itself that you can download. Information about the lake itself is there. The data are listed here. The time series is given here and which or each column is described here. The most important thing to note here is that, of course, the satellite is listed, um, date and time and source are provided. This um, um, is the height variations it, that's shown here um, in um, target height variation with respect to JSON 2 in this case. So that's column six. Import, something else to note here is these acronyms shown here. And that is uh, just to summarize that uh, we talked about atmospheric correction. Um, uh, so this is wet tropospheric correction and dry tropospheric correction uh, applied to altimeter data before heights are derived. And for that, different models are used. And so which model is used for which one and that is just described here. So that's what these acronyms that you see here are. And so you can go through this file basically to get the uh, lake level height uh, variation data. Uh, and you can just go to file and save page as. This allows you to save this file as text file, which I already have saved. So on your computer, you can just save this file uh, and have that time series data uh, on your computer. So if you go back, um, we can also look at a typo that Sean demonstrated last week for uh, Lake Extent. This is Lake Itaipu in, in Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina border. If you click, 
Okay, sorry. So here is again the same information, but important thing to note here, this is smoothed version if you can see, in last several years, there have been several episodes where uh, lake level height has been uh, quite uh, below uh, average. So that's what is shown here. Looking at the uh, second map, which is uh, where long-term mean, multi-year mean reference is used. Again, if you click on Lake Winnebago, you will see this uh, mean level um, is this, and with respect to that, variations are shown here. So this again just shows how things varied with respect to that era. So this information uh, tells you um, how lake level height changed over, like between that 2000 decade and all the way uh, to now. So that is what is important. If there is any long-term trend, it becomes visible in here. So basically, again, here also you can click and download the data. You can explore uh, different lakes. Um, go in here, this is and as you can see, there are sometimes missing data, but basically it provides variations um, in, in, in time. So this basically concludes our uh, demonstration of this data. And then let's go back quickly to the uh, presentation slides. Here are the references uh, we mentioned in the presentation for your information. Also, there is contact information and RSET webpage and training webpage are given here. Um, with that, uh, we uh, conclude today's presentation. Uh, we will have a question answer session now. Uh, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we will answer them in, or in the order that they were received. Uh, we will also post the question and answer uh, uh, on the training website after the conclusion of the webinar. So here's, uh, let's go through the question and answer now. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone. So let's um, start with the question and answer. Um, Question one, is it possible to measure the altimetry of lakes using Landsat data? I uh, said, no, it is not possible. We need, um, this technique focuses on uh, altimetry and Landsat does not have an altimeter. It's an imaging uh, instrument, of, imaging instruments on all Landsat series. So it, it, it can only give you surface extent. Sentinel, one was not mentioned in this uh, particular webinar because it does not have an altimeter. Sentinel-3, on the other hand, has an altimeter, which we mentioned. Um, Sentinel-2 is has similar imagery to Landsat with a little higher resolution, so that was mentioned last time. And um, for, uh, we did, uh, through the, when we went through the question answer sessions last week, we also uh, talked about uh, using Sentinel-1 for uh, extent mapping or uh, for wetland mapping. Yeah, so um, what did uh, question three, uh, getting radar altimeter echo over lakes and reservoirs is a complex thing. Would you elaborate on that? So getting echo is one thing, but getting height from that echo. That is what, what is more complex. And so you, we refer to the tutorial. So uh, what we focused on available height data, which are already derived from altimeter. But if you want to use, uh, say, NVSAT data or Sentinel-3, or even uh, want to explore JSON data for other lakes that uh, then, uh, you will have to go through that processing of data, correction of data, uh, of the range, depending on what atmosphere uh, is intervening. So uh, that there are several steps. 
And so uh, we recommend that you go through the tutorial and also look at Dr. Burkett's papers that we have referred to. Um, so, so technique is validated and has been used since 90s with success. So it, it you know, but it's not something uh, that you take altimeter um, data range and then you will get height data very easily. There is a, there, there are processing steps in between. That's what it means by complex. And the JSON three data available for India and is it free? Yes. So all uh, uh, these data are all free. Uh, that we talked about from NASA, they are all uh, open source data. Uh, so Topax, JSON 1, JSON 2, JSON 3, uh, Sentinel 3, they're all open data, yes. Saral Altika, of course, is there. How is average height derived per pixel in, in altimetry? Is If the radar measures the echoes, how can you tell the distance or pulse with backscatter. So that is what we mean by uh, complex processing. Um, it is wherever, uh, when we saw um, on, on one lake or a water body, that could be multiple repeat cycles. And so you do sometimes have multiple um, height information, uh, one per pixel, but that you can average uh, and, and come up with average uh, height so per pixel it is just one it it's not average height derived per pixel it's one height which which is a reflection of what would be average height in that pixel so if any satellite footprint you see that you see a composite picture over that footprint and that's what it is here also is that be responsible to assume that the water level of the reservoir is the same at one time epoch or some other requirement should be met when we use the average height to estimate the water volume in the reservoir so that is a good question because um, the information we have right now uh, that is what uh, we can use, we have extent and we have average height. Um, so that that's all can give you estimation of volume. That's why I, it is important to have in situ data so that you can see by using remote sensing data, are there and what, what kind of errors you're getting? Are there any biases in the area, in the reservoir of your interest? But uh, that this is one of the limitations that so here you have extent and you have one lake level height data per lake. So if it you know that that's all you have right now. Assuming one has access to both radar altimeter and lidar data, is the radar altimeter preferred for water level measurements? Um, I don't think that is, that is true. We will see um, uh, next. Next week, uh, we talk about ISAT data, and that's a laser uh, altimeter. So it's an altimeter, but it uses laser. So um, if you have um, LIDAR data flying on, on say, airplane um, over a particular reservoir, uh, especially small reservoir where satellite radar altimetry cannot help, I think LIDAR would be used more useful, yes. Can the altimeter be used for monitoring tsunami? So um, ocean uh, for ocean um, um, so for ocean uh, level height, um, sudden variation would be, would be indicative when there is tsunami. So I believe that, yes, it could be used. Is the data for Saraltica free to download and use for research? Um, I will have to look uh, back into that, whether it's available freely or, or not. Uh, but lake level data derived from Saral Altica are um, part of the G Realm data set.
uh, can we estimate silt deposition in reservoirs? Um, we uh, we had this question last week also. Um, I, just by using remote sensing, one cannot estimate how much silt deposition is there. Extent changes as um, silt comes in, and that we can see from satellites as uh, we saw for um, one of the lakes in Middle East. Or, or Caspian Sea, I believe, that uh, how uh, extent was changing. And so that you can see, but you cannot estimate how much silt went in just from this uh, this data. You have to use a model, I believe. Um, laser altimetry will be, uh, uh, question 11 is, uh, will, it be mentioned that how it can help in overcoming some of the limitations. Yes, next week is about uh, ISET to laser altimetry. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We will have a guest speaker who is an expert uh, on laser altimetry and deriving data based on laser altimetry. Is there a list of lakes which will be included in the water level monitoring network? Um, and what would be the special resolution? So uh, global water monitoring, um, their, their goal, as was mentioned, is about right now all the lakes above 100 kilometers square are observed, but to go down to about 50, 200 kilometers is the kilometer square is the goal um, list. Right now, I don't think is available, but as soon as the global water monitoring site is up, um, it should be available. Uh, some known lakes, this is question 30. Some known lakes in my country haven't been captured. What is the reason? Is it the area, depth, or other reasons for this? So um, primarily, it should be area. If it is below 100 kilometers square, you will not see uh, the lake captured there. Um, I think that would be the main reason. Also, uh, it's possible that um, some of the lakes where um, based on uh, where they were lo located, were there in situ data available? That, that and uh, we will look into that. But primarily, it is the it is the area and the size. Can we use the altimeter data for monitoring lakes in mountains region like Himalaya? Um, as we saw, one of the limitations is that uh, if there is a complex topography. It is hard to interpret radar echo. So I, it is I, one has to do research on a particular uh, lake, uh, looking at uh, altimeter data. I am not sure whether uh, any Himalayan lakes are included in the database itself, partly because of this reason. Could the use of the radar altimetry technique confuse lake shores with wet soils? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, so if altimeter is flying in the coastal region, then um, you probably most likely would not use that information or you would not get data for that. Um, but I believe that I mean, I'll, I'll find out exact answer, but I believe that um, for, uh, for for SWAT mission, um, it, it, they have been working on coastal regions. So I, I will have to um, look for a specific answer to your question. But I, I'm, I'm still loud thinking here that um, lake shores and wet soils um, altimeter, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, would have um, issues with that. Uh, 
is GRAM already calibrated with gate station data also? Is it available to obtain data in GRAM in table format? Um, so yes, that's what was shown. Okay, first question, are they calibrated with uh, gauge station data? I'm not sure whether every lake is calibrated. Uh, wherever in situ data are there, I'm sure they are um, calibrated. Um, there is a section about validation and calibration um, in Dr. Burkett's paper. Um, it, so we saw that you can download each lake file as a um, text file, so and then you can use uh, Excel to read that. Why is lake height positive and negative? Because it is a variation with respect to a reference. That's why it is positive and negative. It is not absolute lake level height. It is variation in height. How long does it take for the radar signal to travel from the satellite to the Earth surface and back? So um, it, it is basically it's the electromagnetic as I think Sean must have answered this. It's electromagnetic wave that travels at speed of light, and so that um, when it comes back, that time it takes uh, for radar pulse to be reflected. That echo tells you how much dis distance it went through and came. That's what provides height information. Are there any data sources similar to general unbelievable for smaller lakes? Not that we are aware of, no. There are no data sets based on altimeter, uh, which are for smaller lakes are there. Uh, so question 20, what does it depend on which lakes are chosen to monitor? I see very few European ones. In, is this bound to change or is there any other platform which has other data available? Altimeter data are available from all satellites and um, you can derive height for lakes as long as it's big enough, uh, you can derive it, I believe. It, I, the, I have. I think the lakes are chosen based on it because the, the G realm data, uh, which is there, it's mostly for foreign agriculture service of USDA. So lakes, which are really important for uh, this applic their application, are monitored. Um, so that's one of the reasons. But as you saw uh, in, in future, there will be uh, more lakes and reservoirs included in the database. So here, um, how, how to get data in lakes and reservoirs not listed here, then you have to start with altimeter data uh, themselves and, and process the data depending on the size of the lake you are interested in. If it is a small lake, uh, this data will not be useful. How to calculate the mean level? Does this mean more than satellite? Or do you have other means to measure the mean? So uh, that, that there are um, multiple time uh, going over this. So between, say, in this case, 1993, three to 2000, same satellite goes over a lake again and again in so many years. And so based on that mean height is derived. So you have many samples in so many years, from, even from the single satellite, because uh, uh, either every 10 day or 35 day that is the royal is, is, is sensed. And then the mean is calculated based on that. Do you have any GEE code for accessing lake heights? I don't believe that these data are in GEE, but Sean can correct me if I'm wrong. 
Currently, no, Amita. The data sets that were referenced today are not, but hopefully they will be uploaded in the near future. How do you account for missing values? Really, there is um, no way from satellite to um, when satellite data are missing, uh, then those values, if, if it's just a few samples missing, perhaps you can just interpolate uh, but otherwise, you need in situ data to for for that missing time series uh, location. Does the radar altimetry on the satellite measure along a single line only, or the data is from several line transects along the lake? Yeah. So um, at at any time, um, you we saw. Um, one swath, but over time, yes, there are multiple swaths, and then there are lines that could be transects, yes. Why is the Ka band in the microwave region more preferable over other bands, such as C or X band? Um, I am not sure but if you're asking about um, Sentinel-6, I believe, which has um, KA band altimeter. Um, it has a partly because it has a wider swath in this case. Um, so that is one of the reasons I can think of, but other um, uh, altimeters with a Poseidon has KU band and on C band. So we'll we'll find out exact answer, but uh, it must be the SWAT uh, width that must be one of the reasons. Is there any way to measure the height of lakes 10 less than 100 kilometers square? Not with uh, altimeters flying on current satellites, no. Is it possible to measure lake level variations of small lakes using SWAT? or any other existing mission. Uh, again, yeah, a smaller than 100 kilometers square, several lakes will be included. Uh, but if there are less than 50 kilometers square, I'm not sure whether even SWAT will be able to resolve. Should we consider one satellite measurement or more than one for the small same lake? What do you recommend? Um, so I, I I believe that the the time series that you see uh, from G realm they are from multiple satellites and they are intercalibrated. So if you want a continuous time series, you have to use uh, multiple satellites for sure. If you are if you are happy in current time, if you just want to monitor lake level height, um, I, I guess if you just follow one satellite and if you have in situ data in the lake of your interest, you can derive what kind of biases and errors are there. So then you have better estimation of accuracy. Uh, how do you perform an accuracy assessment uh, to validate the results when working with radar altimetry? So the height derived from altimetry, they're compared with uh, gauge data, as we saw for Lake Ontario, the example was shown in the presentation, and there are other uh, validation studies as well. Um, so where you have gauge data, you compare lake level height, and, and that tells you um, how accurate it is. So it, helps you assess that. So um, there is calibration differences uh, between altimeters. Um, I believe there are. Uh, it is known that compared to Tupex and JSON-1, JSON-2 and JSON-3 have uh, better accuracy. How can we access Sentinel-6 data? Uh, uh, Sentinel-6 data are not out yet. Uh, later this year, they will be available. Deep learning model would be the best to use to get an image in a high resolution. Uh, I am not um, 
it's not my expertise to talk about deep learning model, but uh, we can find out about that and let you know. Radar altimetry measures sea surface topography. We have satellite ellipsoidal height. We get mean sea level height at the end of the study. How do we get precise undulation information to, con to conclude the result? Um, so I think looking at time series, uh, you can gauge how sea level height changed, but um, for, for a single measurement, you have just one height and that's it. Must we use specialized software to pro process the radar collected by radar altimeter in order to get the height? Could you mention a few of them? Uh, we recommend that you look at the tutorials we mentioned from uh, NASA um, Podak and Aviso. Uh, they are uh, dealing with these issues and, and uh, software that you can use. Can the altimeter be altimeter be used for extracting the bathymetry or lake of lakes? Uh, we will have uh, next session. We'll talk about uh, uh, lake bathymetry from ISAT2 data. I notice many lakes and reservoirs in the western US are missing from G realm site. Sorry, is new. Is there a simple explanation for that? Um, no, I, I'm not sure. I think this was USDA selection for these lakes, for foreign agriculture service, they included these lakes. Um, we will find out exact reason, but I believe it was um, yeah, application-based decision of which lakes to include in the data set. Can altimeters be used for detection of shoreline position? Um, I think you need an you need an image to do that. Altimeter would not provide an image; it's just radar echo uh, at nadir. So you need optical data, like we talked about last week, to look at shoreline or where it is. What are the limitations when we want to apply ultimate, ultimately to the coastal area? What are the processing steps? Um, we will talk to uh, the ultimately expert and let you know exactly what the processing steps could be. Again, um, as I mentioned in the previous question is that um, this is not, um, you will not get an image it just happens that um, altimeter is flying over coastline um, and looking at nadir at coastline, then how the process has to be done is we will, um, we will let you know, we'll look into that. Can we download yearly data from global surface water? When I'm downloading, it comes in a file for 2019 only. How can I change it for in between data download? So this is for um, global surface water from last week, I believe. Um, I, I think you have to pick time period for that, right, Sean? Which year you want? Um, yeah, so the, the global surface water product that we demonstrated last week is really looking at the entire time series from 84 to 2019, but there are some other uh, data sets that GRC puts out that are based on monthly as well as yearly water classification. So it gets to more the uh, intra-seasonal as well as intra-annual. And we will put some links to that, uh, to the code to be able to learn more about how to access that data. So, 
So question 41, do you know methods to derive water body bathymetry if you have a time series, the water extent and water level? Um, not from those two, you, you won't be able to derive bathymetry, but we will see next week again how uh, bathymetry is derived from laser altimeter. Um, when you say, can storage change be accurately estimated? Um, so you will get an average bathymetry or lake height, um, and then you have lake extent. So when a water body, uh, because of the repeat cycle, if it is um, different parts are sensed uh, over some time, then you can get some idea of average height, but um, that's the only information you have, lake level height an extent of just one lake level height when altimeter is passing and you or, and you look down at nature and get that data so estimate it's an estimation how accurate again i think it varies from lake to lake is it possible to monitor water level height under the forest cover so um, if you look at this the, the swat a global water monitor will have um, wetland uh, covered in in their their database. They are trying to get uh, a water level height in in wetlands. Um, in tropical forests, um, I'm not sure. We'll find out. Can you explain the way to read the lake height? The lake Winnebago. Uh, mean target high is um, but the lake profile states mean depth is 4.7 meter so uh, this height 161 meter it's above mean sea level variation above mean sea level uh, whereas uh, mean depth of the lake is with respect to the lake geometry so that's what um, that was the difference is here. How effective are these altimeter measurements for water levels of estuaries? So again, SWOT um, is working on the SWOT mission will have uh, altimeter measurements used for estuaries. So those studies will be coming out when the data come out. Again, I believe it will depend on the size that satellite can see. Satellites that will gauge river discharge and height, does it include uh, every type of river? For example, how much uh, precisely it will be in the case of mountain rivers with higher velocity flow? So again, uh, that remains to be seen because of, for mountain region with complex topography, um, we don't know how accurate altimeter uh, data would be for deriving height. So um, I think it is still being validated or uh, studies are being conducted how accurately which river can be sensed. Um, we don't have that information, but uh, we can uh, look into that and see what information is available. So I think there are some great questions here. And um, um, some of the questions we don't know definite answers to, and partly because um, some some questions are uh, there are limitations with what we measure. Um, but we will be uh, editing this question answer uh, session and then posting it online for your information. Next week, we will have our concluding session with uh, laser altimetry and ISET2 data for leak level height and bathymetry. Um, and we'll see how to access that data as well. So we hope to see you next week um, at the same time. And um, 
Thank you very much for attending this session. I want to thank all my RCET colleagues here, um, Sean McCartney, uh, Brock Blevins, Jonathan O'Brien, and uh, Salvin Hudson. They have been uh, great in organizing this webinar, um, in setting up, in editing, presentations. So thanks everyone for your help. And we hope to see you next week in the last session of this webinar series.